All right, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful day here in the Orwellian police state lockdown here in Garfield, Texas on this unbelievably beautifully beautiful spring day. That would be Sunday, April 26, 2020, somewhere around there. So what I love about Sunday, well, I guess for two more Sundays after today, this is where I get to wear both hats here on YouTube and uh, bring you my weekly doomsday sermon, <coughs> which I will also make. This is the honeybee checking out my brand new camera. The, uh, I will also make this Monday's Chronicle of the Collapse. So I have my brand new camera, which is pink, and this honeybee seems fascinated. There is no uh, insect apocalypse or honeybee collapse in Garfield, Texas this spring. And so anyway, I am holding an open house. And I have found the best way to get people to my open house is to launch into a long essay. So in an effort to get someone to show up at my open house today, I do have the house in contract, guys. I'm just looking for backups. So uh, we're going to check in with uh, my old buddy. I guess you would call him an environmental journalist, mainly talking about climate change. And this is our uh, fellow collapsitarian and proud new father. Yes. Collapsitarian and proud new daddy. That would be Roy Scranton, author Roy Scranton. And this is his latest essay from the New Republic. This is a long essay. I'm going to put the link to it. I'm going to have to uh, skip over most of the middle, but you can go on and fill in the blank. So, what is on Roy Scranton's? mine today probably between changing dirty diapers. <clears throat> what is this coming down the road? Good Lord. We have planet eating in, uh, in Garfield, Texas on this beautiful Sunday. What are you going to do? Stop right in front of my house with your planet eating whatever. Anyway, let me get on with it. Uh, take it away, Roy Scranton, and tell us why American foreign policy is not ready for climate change. The U.S. has to rethink its role in an era of ecological disaster. We're getting ready to have an ecological disaster in my, uh, in my front yard here. <laughs> Okay, take it away, Roy. Climate change will define the global political landscape of the 21st century. As Admiral Samuel J. Locklear III, then the head of the U.S. Pacific Command, told journalists back in 2013, political upheaval caused by climate change, quote, is probably the most likely thing that is going to happen that will cripple the security environment probably more likely than the other scenarios we all often talk about, close quote. Events since then over the last seven years have not weakened that assessment as governments around the world have tried to cope with supersized tropical storms, drought, wildfire, rising seas, glacier melt, desertification, epidemics, and unprecedented heat waves. There has been a surge in regional instability, civil wars, border skirmishes, mass displacement, and tensions around shifting geographical boundaries, all of which are reshaping national and international politics from the Mediterranean to the South China Sea, from the Arctic to the Rio Grande. <clears throat> The American foreign policy 
establishment, that broad coalition between Washington, the military-industrial complex, major think tanks, and the mass media, identified by Ben Rhodes as, quote, the blob, has been struggling to cope with this fact since the mid-2000s. In the tumultuous 21st century, the United States will face global and regional instability, threats to energy and food security, new conflicts over resources and borders, and direct assaults on key infrastructure from superstorms and rising seas. As early as 2007, CNA Corporation, a Pentagon-funded think tank, declared climate change to be, quote, a serious threat to America's national security, close quote, and recommended making it a central factor in U.S. strategic planning. As Michael T. Clare, I've interviewed Michael here, you can find that interview somewhere on these, both of these channels. As Michael T. Clare discusses in his recent book titled, All Hell Breaking Loose, the Pentagon made serious efforts for nearly a decade to assess, confront, and address climate change from the Department of Defense 2014 Climate Change Adaptation Roadmap to the launch of the guided missile destroyer USS Stockdale, which in 2016 became the first naval vessel powered by alternative fuels. Yet, those efforts were halted in 2017 by Trump's Executive Order Number 13783 titled Promoting Energy Independence and Economic Growth, which commanded federal agencies not only to abandon planning and preparing for climate change, but also to abolish rules or regulations they had previously adopted. The challenge climate change poses to global politics international security and American foreign policy emerges in a moment when the United States' understanding of its role in the world is uncertain. The post-war liberal order that the United States built out of the bombed ruins of Europe and East Asia has collapsed, repudiated at home, and disgraced overseas. Donald Trump seems to be running his foreign policy on impulse without a clear plan and with an understaffed executive branch. Feckless Democrats, meanwhile, waffle between nostalgia for Obama's empire light and fervid calls to abolish ICE. Meanwhile, bruise-colored clouds mass at the horizon and the first drops of rain flicker on our faces. And so for the whole next middle of this, uh, Roy Scranton uh, reviews uh, a book by uh, history professor Andrew Basevich uh, titled The Limits of Power and breach of trust. And just for time's sake, I need to uh, skip over this. So if you want to find out the book review of that book, you need to go on this link. But let's get to the final pages of the book. In the book's final pages, Basevich argues for seeing Trump's election as an opportunity to shake off the moral and ideological drift of the post-Cold War era, united as a people, and find new moral purpose in an appropriately expansive American project. <clears throat> Quoting uh, Basevich, 
quote, the imperative of addressing climate change may one day offer a suitable replacement for the disastrously misguided consensus foisted on the American people after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Here, in sum, are the makings of a suitable answer to, uh, anyway, that won't make any sense to you. Anyway, uh, Basavik's stance on climate change seems to be somewhat ironically that it offers a chance to make America great again. Yes, we shall see. Okay, <clears throat> so the big question. What should American foreign policy look like in an age defined by cataclysmic ecological rupture? Hmm. Do our vast national wealth and inherited responsibility for historical carbon emissions lay on us an ethical obligation? Are we willing to sacrifice some of our own comforts to help those suffering from our profligacy and neglect? Would U.S. citizens be willing to not only reduce our own carbon emissions, but also take on the task of compelling others to reduce theirs? Would we go to war to make China or India decarbonize? Roy Scranton knows the answer to that question. Anyway, thinking about these difficult questions, I could not help but see a contradiction between Basavik's rhetorical turn toward climate change at the end of the uh, Age of Illusions and his position as the president and the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. The Quincy Institute has emerged as a strong advocate for restraint in American foreign policy. Its fellows have argued that the U.S. should disengage militarily from the Middle East and Southwest Asia abjure state building, base our foreign policy on more di diplomacy and less coercion, force U.S. allies to bear their fair share of costs for global and regional security, decrease military spending, and in the words of Deputy Director Stephen Wertheim, quote, end America's commitment to armed supremacy and embrace a world of pluralism and peace." Close quote. All well and good, yet, the inconvenient truth, yet climate change driven destabilization has created and will continue to create situations that call for military intervention coercion, and even state building. As Michael Clare discusses in All Hell Breaking Loose, the U.S. military has already been crucial to international disaster relief efforts in the Philippines, Mozambique, and Liberia, and has intervened in climate-related conflicts in Mali and Syria. Such efforts, while limited and often inadequate, are only going to grow more necessary as the Earth's climate continues to transform. The Quincy Institute takes its name from President John Quincy Adams and its tagline from Adams' famous decree that America, quote, goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, close quote. But what do we do when the Godzilla of climate change, a monster created in large part by American consumption, goes on a global rampage? All hell breaks loose, delineates, quote, a spectrum of increasingly severe disasters resulting in ever more complex and demanding missions for American military forces, close quote, which Claire describes as a, quote, ladder of escalation. 
Claire's ladder based on Pentagon and intelligence reports as well as congressional testimony in dozens of interviews rises from simple disaster relief to extended operations in failing states facing climate-driven collapse then to complex multinational deployments in response to interruptions in global energy infrastructure or food supply chains, then to major power conflicts over resources and borders, and finally to climate-driven emergencies in the United States itself. All of these scenarios would put significant pressure on military operational tempo, challenge traditional ideas about intervention, including restrictions on the use of military force within the United States, and demand continued support for a large military able to deploy swiftly around the world, such scenarios might well include different degrees of nation building, counterinsurgency, and preemptive intervention. Don't you love that term, that Orwellian term, preemptive intervention? Yes. Uh, I think you're going to see a whole lot of that from the U.S. military in the 21st century. Thank you, Michael Clare. <clears throat> they might also include efforts to stabilize failed states and uncontrolled spaces, precisely the kind of messy, ill-defined, long-term missions from which the Pentagon finds itself unable to escape in Afghanistan, again, uh, you can certainly expect to see a lot more Afghanistans uh, here in the next few decades. <clears throat> okay, back to Roy. Although I think of myself as both an anti-militarist and an anti-interventionist, have written at length about the calamitous American war in Iraq in which I participated as a soldier and am, and am deeply sympathetic to Basavik's work and the need for restraint in American foreign policy, I cannot help but admit that even a reasonable anti-militarist position faces serious challenges when it comes to coping with the emergent turmoil of global climate change. Avoiding troublesome military entanglements in the Middle East and Africa would mean standling, standing idly by while innocents suffer, states collapse, and zones of chaos spread. There's a forecast for Africa in the 21st century. Repudiating the hubris of American exceptionalism could also mean negligently abjuring any special responsibility for the exceptional wealth and power the United States enjoys protecting our men and women in uniform and holding back our military power might be no more than craven rationalization for refusing to use what to use that power to help those in need in order to begin to answer the question of what it means to be American today, we need a coherent foreign policy that makes sense of the United States' role in a world being radically transformed by, among other things, the unintended consequences of American prosperity. We need a vision for the United States' role in a world defined by climate change. One possibility 
would be for the United States to see its wealth and its responsibility for historic greenhouse gas emissions as placing on it, meaning on us, an obligation for leadership. Such leadership would include taking the initiative on a global energy transition, uh-huh, supporting other countries' efforts at transition, uh-huh, and even enforcing standards for transition among those nations that prove recalcitrant, can you say India? Such leadership would also by necessity include taking a major role in dealing with natural disasters, political instability, and threats to global and regional security. This role would be diplomatic. Uh, I don't know what planet uh, uh, Roy is heading to now, guys, just because I offer other voices does not mean I agree with their future. <clears throat> anyway, this role would be diplomatic, but it would also be military. The United States military is the only force today capable of multiple rapid global deployments in response to humanitarian crises and the only force capable of compelling limits on greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, what Roy fails to point out here is the U.S. military is the number one biggest emitter of greenhouse gases of any gang of uh, apocalyptic horsemen on the planet. <clears throat> As with the Green New Deal, the idea of transforming the U.S. military into a climate force is reductive and beset with numerous difficulties. Who was it that I interviewed about six months ago talking about how we were going to turn the U.S. military into a force for good for this planet? Uh, again, what hopium is Rory Scranton uh, smoking here? Anybody who thinks the U.S. military is going to be transformed into a force for good for this planet, please. Anyway, yet it is at least an idea and one that attempts to engage with the scale and urgency of the problems we face with catastrophic climate change, which is more than one can say about most foreign policy proposals today. What we urgently need, as Basavik writes in his book, The Age of Illusions, is, quote, real debate about real choices, close quote, debate that brings together scientists and soldiers, activists and conservatives, visionaries and critics, then confronts them with the existential crises of planetary ecological collapse and climate transformation. In the Age of Illusions, as in his other books, Basavik shows himself to be an astute and unrelenting critic a great dispeller of imperialist illusions. The need for such disillusionment cannot be overstated, but it is also not enough. We face in our lifetime the greatest challenge human civilization has ever confronted. These challenges are inescapable for even if we stopped burning fossil fuels entirely. Today, the climatic and ecological ramifications of 200 years of extraction, environmental mismanagement, and reckless waste will continue playing out for millennia. There is little evidence to suggest 
that human beings will find a way to manage this catastrophe. How about no evidence? Or that global civilization will persevere in some now recognizable form. Any faith we might have in the future must be based on a realistic assessment of our situation and a willingness to find practical solutions, even if those solutions are dissatisfying, incomplete, or compromised. All hell is truly breaking loose, as Claire suggests in his book's title. We either accept that grim fact and try to find a way forward, making allies with ideological opponents and focusing on salvaging what we can or we doom ourselves to bickering fruitlessly about who gets which deck chair while 5,000 years of collective human effort break apart under crashing waves of violence and disaster. The 21st century will be defined by climate change, who we are as Americans, and how we are remembered will be defined by what we do about it. Thank you, uh, fellow collapsitarian and proud daddy, Roy Scranton. Uh, you know, I was trying, I've been trying to get Roy to come on the show, and I remember this email he sent me. Uh, what he did, he sent me a picture of, of the scream, you know, that, you know, the painting, ah, with this screaming, jarring uh, electric guitar thrash playing behind it. Uh, that, was, uh, that was his uh, interview with Collapse Chronicles was the scream. Anyway, so we probably won't be able to get the uh, new daddy on the show, particularly since uh, the show is shutting down at least temporarily till all of this uh, madness blows over. So, uh, anywho's, uh, well, I failed in getting a buyer to show up at my open house. I actually had five people come by yesterday, but I guess it's such a beautiful day uh, that people are figuring out other ways to enjoy their lockdown. I guess thousands and thousands of people in California are flocking to the beaches to uh, have a little bit of social intercourse as more and more people say, we have had enough of the Orwellian police state and I highly advise you to get out there and do what you can to get take back your own life. Bye guys.